You're obliged to pretend respect for people and institutions you think absurd. You live attached in a cowardly fashion to moral and social conventions you despise, condemn, and know lack or foundation. It is that permanent contradiction between your ideas and desires and all the dead formalities and vain pretenses of your civilization which makes you sad, troubled, and unbalanced. In that intolerable conflict you lose all joy of life and all feeling of personality because at every moment they suppress and restrain and check the free play of your powers. And that is the poisoned and mortal wound of the civilized world. And that was said by Octave Mirbo, and the quote was taken from a book called The Torture Garden. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I'll be your host for the next hour. What is this shift that is happening in the world today? We know it's there, we know there's something going on, but what is it? Well, it could be one of two things. Well, actually, it could be one of many things, because there are many things going on in the world today. But ultimately, there are only two main sides to the coin. And so, when it happens, and as it shifts, ultimately the shift will be one of these two things, one of these two sides of the coin. And the really interesting part about it at this stage of human development is that both sides are equally accessible at this stage. And truly, we could still tip either way. But I suppose some clarification needs to be made as to what these two sides of the coin are and really what these two sides of the coin are, are the side of good and the side of evil. And evil does exist, folks. Evil is a particular type of energy that does exist in the world. It does exist in the field. It's a particular type of psychopathic force that exists almost below the surface, but it's there. It's there throughout this particular creation that we're currently in. And... As far as a human manifestation goes, well, evil is a word for an emotional state or a conscious state, a state of conscious inflicting of harm upon other people and upon the world at large. And this is perhaps a somewhat simplistic definition, but in trying to bring it down to a human level and to a place where people can understand it on an interpersonal level, This is really what it is. Doing either evil or doing good is a state of conscious choice by the individual. Now looking at the polarities that exist between a state of good and a state of evil, many would compare this to the polarities between a state of love and a state of fear. And in many ways this is true. But To say that such is always the case is erroneous because there are sometimes people who do evil things because they are in a state of fear due to the evil that's been done to them. And one would question, is this a conscious choice? Is this a choice people are consciously making to do evil? Or are they doing it out of the fear they have from someone else, perhaps because of the love they have? towards other people as an example perhaps your person your child's been abducted and you're being told you have to go and commit evil against another human being or your child will come to harm this is the sort of situation that i'm talking about is that conscious evil no it's not it's a person who is a victim of conscious evil but their actions in doing harm to another out of the fear they have for themselves or the life of their child would not really be construed as evil. So there's different degrees, and associating the polarities of love and fear exclusively with the polarities of good and evil is somewhat erroneous at its basis, because there are different degrees of good and evil, and yet there are two clear polarities between love and fear. 
But now looking at that scenario, the scenario that I just outlined for you, whereby you were doing harm to another out of your love for somebody else and your fear that they may come to harm. So you are essentially involved in an evil activity through no real choice of your own. And ultimately, out of both love and fear, then you can take that to a more subtle level and you can look at the society in which we all live. You can look at the fact that we are all required to pay to be here and should we not be able to pay the cost of our life, then our life will be discarded, will be thrown out on the pile, will become homeless, will be living in an underground shelter and our children will have a very bad life. And in order to prevent this happening, we involve ourselves in corporate activity. We involve ourselves in unethical business practices. And ultimately, folks, any business practice whereby you are profiting from the basic needs of others is an unethical business practice because business itself is unethical and its basis. And so you're out there performing unethical practices in order to support your family due to the love you have for your family and the fear of what may happen to them if you don't go and perform these unethical practices and essentially perpetrate this evil against the rest of the world. And that's the way our system has been designed. So what we have here is, as I often said, a psychopathic system whereby people are torn between love and fear and they can be in a state of both at the same time and this causes them to perpetuate evil in the world. So the question must then be asked, are these evil people? Well, no, of course they're not. They're good people, but they have been manipulated by the system in such a manner as to perform actions that will make this underlying evil that has been superimposed over the human psyche manifest in the world around us. And that is essentially the way this system has been designed. It's been made that way from the ground up, which is why so many people have such difficulty participating and functioning properly within the parameters of the system, and that even those who can function properly within it end up with all sorts of emotional problems and problems with their health and all sorts of stuff due to the underlying tension of the actions that they're forced to perform every day. So the system itself creates a huge schism in the mind of man. And it does this because it is an essentially evil system because it is based on psychopathic principles whereby everybody within the system must support an economic model over that which is good and that which is right, that which is proper. They must always support the economic model regardless of the expense that economic model has to human life, to plant life, to animal life, to all life. It's not about life. It's about balancing the books. That's the system that we've got. And due to that fact alone, it becomes glaringly apparent just how evil this system is. Its whole basis is in evil. And it is a result of this underlying evil and this underlying fear, this psychopathic vibration that has superimposed itself over human consciousness. So the question is, where did it come from? And well, I have my own views as to where it comes from. Many people have identified it as the difference between God and Satan which I believe is a very disempowering way to look at things because it adds credence to the notion that this is something that is happening external to yourself and that stopping this evil in the world is beyond any means that you possess. That's erroneous and I think it's disempowering. The evil actually comes from within us, from a force that has superimposed itself over our consciousness. And I believe that realizing that it is there is half the battle in dealing with it. I also think that the whole God versus Satan scenario is a construct. The idea that a saviour is coming to save us is also a construct. 
it serves to externalise the problem and put us in a position where we don't believe we can ever deal with it ourselves. And ultimately, the only people who can deal with it is ourselves. But we have to look to find that power within rather than expecting some figure to appear from outside of us and come and save us. In fact, I think the religious construct of the saviour and redeemer is one of the most dangerous and disempowering constructs that's ever been forced upon not only human consciousness, but upon the rest of the reality that is affected by the belief of a vast majority of human consciousness in the saviour-redeemer scenario. This scenario, folks, it really has allowed people to carry out an incredible amount of evil in the world, and it's allowed them to do it in the belief that what they were doing was right and was ordained and condoned by God. I mean, this belief in this saviour has brought about situations such as the Dark Ages, the Spanish Inquisition, the loss of shamanism throughout the entire globe, and what has literally been the rape and destruction of so many cultures and so many countries across the face of this beautiful planet. And it has all come from this belief in an external saviour and the belief that one must inflict what they perceive to be the will of God upon all others that they meet. And should they not bow and accept your belief as their own, then they are an abomination and should be exterminated. This is what the belief in an external saviour has done to this world. And people may think me a little harsh and a little critical for saying that, but really, folks, if you look back at history, you'll find that it's true. This is the way it was through the Dark Ages, through the Spanish Inquisition. This is what happened to South America and other countries that were infiltrated by missionaries to pave the way for the armies that were to follow. This is what was done to shamanism. This is what has been done to virtually any countries that defied the invasion of the church. This is what was done to North America. This is what was done to Australia, New Zealand. I mean, the list goes on. And as I've said so many times before, I think the main thing to look at when looking at the brutality with which the church carried out its takeover of human consciousness what becomes glaringly obvious is that the biggest enemy the church faced was the shamanistic traditions and any race of people that still maintained a good connection to the earth upon which we live essentially any race that still lived in harmony with the planet and I think this is very telling. I think there's a huge clue there as to what the solution is to our problems. And I'll just leave shamanism there for a minute. I'll just just put that little nugget in your head. I'll attempt to come back and talk about that a bit further later on in the show. Uh, but for now, I would ask you to consider the following. Now, in all the shows that I've done for you over the last five years, the one underlying point and the one underlying message that I've been attempting to get across to people is the concept of freedom, the concept of knowing exactly who and what you are, and hopefully helping people perceive what we could actually create were we to pay attention to the world around us and if we were to act in our hearts, and if we were to find ourselves free. And that's really been the point of it all, hasn't it? I mean, the point of me doing anything and saying anything to you is freedom. You know, if I could say the one thing in the world that is important to me and the one reason why I do anything that I do, that can be summed up in that one word, freedom. I do what I do for freedom and it's interesting that I would do that because in all my travels and in all the shows that I've done in much of the correspondence I've received 
and many of the people that I've spoken to, what I've found is that there are so many people who are aware of the problems and who are fighting the good fight. But what I also found was that what it is mainly about for people is the fight. And that in their hearts, most of the people that I met, not all of them, but certainly a great deal of them, are in fact terrified of the concept of true freedom. And they will do anything they can to fight the fight, yet there is no real intention, there is no concept of what we would do if we were to win. It's not about winning, it's about fighting the fight. That's what I've seen with people. And it's a very interesting dichotomy. I've found that most people want the freedom to be able to go down the shop and buy their food. They want the freedom to be able to buy a house somewhere. They want the freedom to work at whatever job they wish to work at. They want the freedom to marry who they please, to drive whatever car they would like to drive, and to run whatever business they would like to run. And they're prepared to pay whatever costs are incurred by doing all of these things. But of course, all of these things also include the freedom to pay taxes, the freedom to do what you're told, and the freedom to walk between the lines and follow whatever rules the politicians give you to follow. I mean, why do you have to buy a house? Why shouldn't you be given a house simply because you're alive? Why do you have to pay to be alive? If you wish to marry someone, why do you need to purchase a marriage license and get the government involved and turn it into a three-way contract? Isn't it between you and the person you love? If so, why do you need to get the government involved? Well, that's right, it's because of the economic value that's attached to your love, to your wedding, and it's information you may need in the settlement should you ever get divorced because you need to look at all the economics of the whole thing. But really, what does economics have to do with love? And if you're going to place conditions on the person that you're marrying and you wish to create a prenuptial agreement and all this sort of stuff, well, do you really love the person? Or is your marriage simply a matter of economics? But that's what freedom is to people, folks. It's freedom to conduct their life in an economic manner, freedom to purchase what they want to purchase, freedom to be enslaved to a corporate system and what it also means for many people is the freedom to point and complain about all these control mechanisms while demanding their freedom but really what freedom is it that they're wanting what is this freedom for most people because most people don't actually want to be free most people simply want to complain about not being free but they don't actually want to be free because freedom is 100% self-responsibility. That's what freedom is. It certainly isn't anything else. I mean, it isn't freedom of choice. Freedom of choice is part of freedom, but freedom of choice is not freedom. Freedom is 100% liability for all your actions, everything you say and do. That's what true freedom is. True freedom is owning yourself and being responsible for that. And what I've found is that most people, even those who complain the loudest about not being free, and in fact especially those who complain the loudest about not being free, are absolutely terrified of true freedom. You see, I don't want to buy a house, folks. I just want to walk into the forest and build one, wherever I feel like building it, because that place feels right for me to be. That's what I'd like to do. I'd like to go build a house somewhere set up a free energy device and kick back with my chosen companion, someone whom I love and someone who loves me. And perhaps I have some sort of a simplistic concept of it, but to me, that is freedom. Technology isn't freedom. I'd like to be free enough to not have to log on to the computer every day and go on the air every week, gently asking people to wake up before we head into a nightmare transhumanist world where all freedom is lost. I much prefer not to have to do that. And so I personally can't wait until people wake up to the fact that they actually are free, should they choose to be so. Because at the moment, as free as I perceive myself to be, I can't walk into the forest and build myself a house because nobody else is free. 
And so therefore the society in which we are all forced to function will not let me be free, will not let me do what I wish to do. And personally, I think the recent controversy surrounding the OPPT is a good example of this. And my God, the amount of vitriol I've received for daring to have these people on my show and I'm being told that I'm promoting the New World Order and all sorts of stuff. I'm not promoting anything, folks. The only thing that interests me about the OPPT, as I've said on numerous occasions, is the one UCC filing that says that I'm answerable only to the Creator. And you know why I'm interested in it? I'm interested in it because it's a UCC filing, because the entire corporate system comes under UCC law. And if there's a filing within their fictional system that they're using to intimidate me and to remove my freedoms, if there is a filing within that fictional system that says that I'm answerable only to the creator, then they're not able to use that fictional system against me anymore. That's my only interest in the OPPT. Because now, for those people who live in a paper-based reality... Well, guess what? It says there on that piece of paper that I'm free. And so if you're going to use that UCC system against me, you sure as hell better rebut that filing. That's my only interest in the OPPT. And what I see it as is a stepping stone. And the amount of people that are locked into word magic and keep falling back into legalese and back into law is just astounding. Every single email that I've had, every single response I've had from anybody giving me all of these reasons, all the things it says in common law and all the things it says in UCC law and all the things it says in legalese, still just can't figure out that it's all fiction. We made the whole thing up, folks, and ultimately we're free should we choose to be that way. So it's been very interesting to see the response that this has had and the response that people are giving to the concept that they might actually be free should they choose to exercise their own free will to be that way. Seems pretty simple to me anyway, folks. But again, people don't really want to be free because people would then have to be 100% responsible for themselves. And that's the problem. It's not about freedom for most people. It's about the fight. But I think things are changing. I think consciousness is shifting. And I think we've been given a choice, folks. I mean, we've got to do something. I mean, we can sit here and demand freedom all we want, but we can't just all say, okay, now we're all free to do anything we want because we'll have complete chaos. The world will fall apart. We have all of this infrastructure here and we have to decide what to do with it and rein it in somehow and put it back in the right direction. And we've got to provide a mechanism, a path to freedom that will allow us to do that. And I don't know what it is, folks. Like I said, I just want to go into the forest and build a house. I want to know that my son has a viable future. I want to know that there aren't people rotting in jails for victimless crimes. I want to know that there is not a corporate system in place that is raping this planet and destroying all life on the earth. And I'll support anything that brings this system into focus. Bearing in mind that most people that are still locked into the mainstream are locked in there because they live in a paper-based reality. So if we have to use paper in order to wake them up, well, I have no problem doing that either. I mean, what's the option, folks? We can just allow the system to go on and keep complaining and whinging at each other? I mean, is that the plan? Because that's what we've been doing, and looking around me, I don't think it's working out too well for us, folks. So is that what we're going to do? We're just going to sit around and complain? Or should we perhaps put down our differences, put down our egos, and all get together at the same table and work out a viable plan for a viable future that's going to work for everybody? all get together on the same page and realize that enough is enough. And if we all pull together and put our egos aside, we can all put some input into the situation and we can create a better world. The only other option that we've got is to allow these psychopathic lunatics that are currently in charge to keep destroying the place around us and to keep removing our freedoms, to pollute all the water, to control what's left, and to pack society into tight little pockets where they can get everybody to work the mines for them 
and destroy this planet and turn us all into transhuman robots like they want to do. So that's our choice, folks, and I think the time to make the decision is now because we really are at the tipping point right now. We are on a knife edge, and we can still go in either direction. We can succumb to the path of evil that has been laid out for us by the psychopaths that run this world, or we can consciously step into our power and choose the path of good. And the choice has to be made, folks, because we can't sit around arguing about things any longer and allow the world to turn to hell around us. We just can't do it. We have to take the matter in hand. We have to shift the paradigm and build something new. And the system that we've got is broken. It can't be repaired. We need to build something else. And it needs to be built from the ground up. I mean, what's the other option, folks? Allow the politicians to do it? Go and petition these people and ask them, would they please change things? Well, I think we've tried that too, and that hasn't worked out very well for us either. The time to rein the system in is now. It's this year. And ultimately, the choice as to whether we do it is going to come down to each one of you out there listening to this show. Each one of the people out there in the world, it's going to come down to that. And folks, put your egos aside. Understand that there is no one saviour coming. It isn't you, it isn't anybody. It's not about your way. It's about what is good for all of us, and we all need to be party to that decision. We all need to have some input, figure out what the process is, what's going to work, and we all need to get involved on a grassroots level and stop fighting about things, because ultimately we're all fighting a common enemy, and what this enemy is doing is it is dividing us. Very interesting, folks. Very interesting to observe that so many people who cry out for freedom don't actually want it because they have a vested interest in maintaining the fight. But it certainly is a crucial time in history, folks. It's a crucial time of change, and it's quite fascinating sitting here on the fence wondering which way it's all going to go. But I think it's break time here, so I'll leave it there for now. Thank you for spending this time with me today, and I'll be back to speak to you again in a few minutes. Thanks for listening. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So, in looking at the deeper aspects of good and evil, of freedom and slavery, of love and fear, you can see that there's a delicate interplay between all of them. And as I said before the break, I find it fascinating that people want freedom so much and yet they are also so fearful of freedom because they are. And like I said, for many people, it's more about the fight for freedom than it is about freedom itself. And when freedom comes, what will it look like? Will it look like the OPPT or will it look like something else? And as I said, folks, even with the OPPT, I have difficulty with a lot of the things I'm seeing in there because a lot of what I'm seeing is stuff that's written down on paper. And so it's reverting back to a paper-based reality. I can see that it's done that way because there are many people who will need uh, some sort of an infrastructure in place in order for them to make a smooth transition. But as I said, the only thing that really interests me is the one UCC filing which removes me from the UCC system. The rest of it doesn't concern me. I don't need contracts to bond myself to any new system. I already have a trust relationship, a trust contract, a preeminent trust that exists between myself and my creator that I don't tell anybody about because it's a private trust. The only people who need to know about it are the creator and myself. So, as I said, I don't need to bond myself to anything and I don't need anybody to speak for me. And so, therefore, my interest in the whole thing dissipates at anything below that original filing that removes anybody who be essentially anybody who is alive from the clutches of the UCC system and does so within its own parameters. I mean, I already knew that I wasn't part of the system anyway, but that one filing informs the people who operate within the system 
So that's why I like that one finally, and that's why that interests me. And I see that it puts the corporate system squarely on the table for people to see, and it gives them an opportunity to think about freedom and to realize that it is actually within their grasp should they choose to be free. But the question that I'm asking here is what will freedom look like? What will freedom look like for all the people of the world? How will they make a transition to freedom? And are people even ready to be free? I mean, when I look at the world, folks, I have to ask the question because so many people I see that are locked into the parameters of this system simply don't know any other way. For these people, life must be structured. Society must be structured, and they have no concept of even thinking anything different to that. It's just outside their realm of logic. A lot of people can't conceive of any type of reality that wasn't structured. They cannot even remotely entertain the concept of a world without money. They cannot imagine what they would do with themselves if they didn't get up and go to work at some job they dislike every day. And that is unfortunately the current state of a good section, a very large section of human consciousness. So that's the question, folks. What would these people do with freedom? Are these people ready to be free? And when that freedom comes, what will it look like? Because freedom is something people have to participate in. That's really what it is. It's not about anything that's written down on paper anywhere. It's not about any rules that anybody offers anybody. It's about respecting yourself and respecting people around you. That's ultimately what it's all about. That's the one parameter that people need to abide by in order to experience true freedom. And so what prevents people from being good to themselves and treating themselves with respect and treating others around them with respect? Well, again, it comes back down to good and evil because people are forced to operate within the parameters of an evil system, a system that is based on psychopathic principles. And when people are forced to act within psychopathic principles in order to perform the routines of daily life, then you can see how this evil becomes an underlying aspect of their lives that they very often don't even know is there. But it creates this schism, this underlying tension within human psyche which prevents people from respecting themselves and others. It removes people of their ability to give to the people around them because they're always forced to support an economic model. And so they can't give. And as I've mentioned before, we've even got to the stage of existence where people perceive time itself to be valuable. Time is money. And the whole concept of that is is so far removed from reality that it, it beggars belief. And yet many people cannot even conceive of the possibility of it being different, of time not being money. I mean, sure, time is valuable, but is it economically valuable? Why does time have an economic value attached to it? Why does your life have an economic value attached to it? It's only there because of this underlying evil. Because that's what the money system is, folks. The whole central banking system, it's its evil. Its underlying energy is a very, very dark and very evil and very controlling energy. And you can see how this compounds to create a state of disrespect within our society. Disrespect for all things. Disrespect for anything ultimately except the economic model. I mean, generally speaking, as a society, if you look at society itself and the way it functions then the underlying tone is that of support for an economic system. And this itself is evil. And it is through the evil nature of this system and the fact that it's superimposed there subliminally in everybody's consciousness that prevents people from ever taking the path of good. Very often they're simply not able to because it's simply not economically viable for them to do so. And so how do we remedy this situation? Well, that's where it comes back to shamanism. 
because the true shaman of the world know these things. They know that central banking is evil. They know that any type of control system is evil. They know that government is evil. That's why I respect this one UCC filing that says, okay, enough is enough. Anybody who is alive is no longer subject to that UCC system. That's it. That dissolves a whole lot. Let's throw all the paper away from that point. Because any type of system that's put in place by people in order to control the lives of others, any type of structured society that is structured via a mechanism that seeks to control the behavior of those within that society is an evil system. People would say, oh, we need this control grid in place in order to protect us against those people within society who are psychopathic. Well, folks, it's actually a psychopathic system, and it's designed to create psychopathic people to exploit any psychopathic or sociopathic trait in anybody that is born within the system. And so by removing the system itself, you will eventually remove the psychopaths from society. And all you will need is people who have a shamanistic understanding of the world and the psychopaths who attempt to gain hold within any society will soon be identified and removed from the society because that's what a shamanistic understanding of reality gives you. It gives you the ability to be able to deal with these type of people. And that's why shamanism was such a huge threat to the Crown Corporation when it was formed and why the Vatican system went to so much trouble to wipe out shamanism. Because it's only through a shamanistic understanding of the world that the world can be properly managed. And the management that comes from a shamanistic understanding of the world isn't a control grid. It's simply full connection to the earth and full connection to the senses and full connection to that which is good in the world. And it does this by identifying the psychopathic undertone and dealing with the psychopathic undertone and understanding where it comes from. And that's one of the biggest problems with things such as the New Age movement is that Many love and lighters believe that the way forward is to ignore the psychopathic undertone. But it can't be ignored, folks. It's got to be identified. It's got to be perceived. And people have to be aware of its existence and be on guard should it ever seek to impose systems of control upon society. And because people lost their shamanistic skills and they let down their guard, we now see that it has gained hold. And this is the type of world that we now have. It's a result of this psychopathic undertone that exists within the collective human consciousness and is perpetuated due to the loss of the shamanistic traditions and the shamanistic skills. It's a result of the loss of this shamanistic perspective to good and evil, the shamanistic perspective of love and fear and the shamanistic knowledge which helped keep the world in a state of balance. So what then is the way forward? How do we extricate ourselves from the current human predicament? Many people believe it's through things such as the People's Trust. There are many people who are supporting other things. And many of the people who are operating within all of these groups are good people. Whether the group has integrity or not, many of the supporters of the projects are good people. They're just people who want change. But the problem is that all of the people who support all of these different projects all have tunnel vision and can not see anything past their own project. This is what I'm seeing sitting here on the fence looking down at it all. But I'm seeing that occasionally each one of these organizations or movements will bring forth a nugget of, of pure beauty of pure truth and pure gold so why not take all of these nuggets and look at the whole thing shamanistically and put it all together to bring about some real positive change because we've got to stop fighting we've got to stop creating different movements and thinking our movement is the only way we have to bring it all together and realize that anything that stirs the pot is a good thing 
Anything that puts the corporate system squarely on the table for all to see is a good thing. Anything that exposes the underlying evil of this psychopathic system that we are all forced to endure is a good thing. And we can't keep going on the way we're going. We cannot keep complaining about this system and we cannot keep fighting each other and resisting every opportunity that comes along for change. We have to find the gems of gold in each one of these movements, in each one of these organizations, and take those gems and combine it into one solid movement that is a movement of the people. The people have had enough. The people want change. The people have now decided that we're going to take reality in a different direction. But we have to bring it all together in order to do it. It's the only way any real positive change is ever going to be achieved. Remember, folks, divide and conquer is the motto. And the easiest way to divide people is via the mechanism of ego. Everybody believes their way is the right way. And there are so many people who have this belief that they are the saviour of the world and that they have constructed the only path that is possible. But I believe we have to put this aside and we have to start working together. We've got to start viewing things a little bit more shamanistically. And when I refer to shamanism, folks, I'm not referring to going and doing ayahuasca. The plant medicines are a part of a certain aspect of shamanism. But shamanism is really a deeper understanding of reality. Because when you can view reality energetically, then you're not lost in fear, you're not lost in any of the stranger aspects of reality, you're only really in the now. And when you're in the now, you can see both polarities very clearly, and you lose all fear of these polarities. But you can also look at the world and you can see the state that it's in, and you can't deny that the world is in a very bad state and it's heading in a very bad direction. Anybody who refuses to admit that is in a state of pure denial. And it's also true that the only way the world is ever going to be remedied is through action by the people. No matter how much you focus on 5D or whatever it is that people focus on, whatever it is the New Age people focus on, no matter how much of a high vibration you believe you're in, you need to remember that you are living in a 3D reality. And... The 3D reality we are living in very much needs your attention because the 3D reality we are living in is infected by an underlying evil, an underlying psychopathic vibration that is allowed to exist purely because people refuse to look at it, people refuse to face it, because it's only by facing it and by interacting with the world in a different manner than the way we currently do this underlying evil will ever be addressed and folks look i think the time we can deal with this underlying evil is now the time is right simply because of the period in history in which we are currently in in fact the mayans reference the time that we are currently in as to being a period of no time where we actually shape the new paradigm and that's why I think there is so much controversy on the table right now, why there is so much attention being paid to the corporate system. You know, it's only March, and there are so many things snowballing at the moment that it's difficult to keep abreast of all of the things that are happening. There is certainly a lot of negative stuff being imposed upon the people from all directions, but there is also a lot of really good things happening. There's so many little things that are happening that are showing that the system is falling apart. It's it's virtually in its death throes. Because it's a crazy system, folks. Don't give it more credence than it deserves. There are a lot of people saying that all these terrible things are going to happen. And sure, we're heading in a bad direction, but don't give the powers that believe they be any more credit than they deserve because things are far from lost and we do have a very real opportunity to bring about some positive change if we all start getting involved. And that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing so much happen this year. There are so many negative things happening and so many positive things happening and so many 
people are working to put this corporate system squarely on the table so that people can address it, that I, I think that no matter which way it goes, we're going to see that we're living in a vastly different world by the end of the year. Well, maybe by the end of the year might be pushing it a little bit, but certainly by the end of next year or by the middle of next year, I think we're going to see that things are very different to what they currently are. And I think that can only be a good thing. I really do. And I think a lot of this is being brought about because people are recognising that there is an evil in the world. People are recognising there is a psychopathic tone to this whole social structure that we live under. And really, folks, I mean, it's so obvious for all to see. It, it really is. I mean, as I've said a million times on the show, the fact that we're supporting an economic model over the needs of humanity and over the needs of all life on the planet clearly indicates how corrupt and how psychopathic this system is. I think people are realising it because as the money system is collapsing and people are beginning to understand that they can lose all that they believe they own simply due to the value of paper is becoming a real concern for them. It's starting to actually become something real that they can see in their mind. They're starting to see how this works and they're starting to realise that their life is worth more than paper and that the paper, far from being wealth, actually dictates what level of scarcity they are in. Because that's what a money system does. It imposes contrived scarcity over people. And I think the world's beginning to wake up to it, and so we're going to see some major changes. But whatever they are, folks, it's time for us all to get together. We've got to stop fighting amongst ourselves. We've got to stop shooting down anything that comes along which may offer us a grain of truth that we can combine with all the other grains of truth that we've got. We've got to stop looking for the one perfect remedy that's going to be given to us on a silver platter We've got to start thinking about ourselves, realize that remedy starts at home. It starts in your own heart. No one can come and fix your life for you. No one can offer you a system that's going to work because it's a control system, whatever it is. If it's a system, then it's a control system. And we don't need a control system. What we need is to always operate from our hearts in all that we do, to live in a state of service for creation but also putting ourselves on an equal par with everybody else. Remember, folks, being in service to creation doesn't mean you allow yourself to be drained and used by other people. You've got to serve all creation equally, and that includes yourself. So don't ever take yourself for granted, but don't give too much credit to people around you who claim to be your controllers, because ultimately they're no different to you. And don't give the system too much credit. Don't perceive that it is this all-empowering thing that can come and devour you because just that belief will make it so. I don't see it as any all-empowering thing that can come and devour me at all. I see it as a fictional system that only exists on paper and I am living flesh. And once people gain that understanding alone, it's an incredibly empowering understanding. Now, when you see that in yourself, folks, then you can see it in others and you can learn to respect others and it is through that mutual respect that we can change everything. So whatever we create, wherever we go from this point, it has to have this mutual respect and understanding for each other at its core foundation, whatever it is. And all we need is a system that is loosely structured enough to allow mankind to return to what we should be and to remember who we are, essentially a system which will allow us to realize that we don't need a system so that it can just fall away from us and allow a great remembering to take place. Because ultimately that's what this is, folks. It's a great remembering. Anything that anybody believes they've learned from any of my shows, all I've done is I've hopefully prompted you to remember that which is and that which you already know within yourself. And that's how you know, folks, when it really resonates because it's something that you remember. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a time in history when mankind remembers who and what we are. When we remember our connection to the planet, when we begin to understand and remember our connection to all reality and to all creation, and we begin to remember the power that we have to bring about positive change. 
But it's got to start at home, folks. You only need paper to tell you you're free if you persist in living in a paper-based reality. But if you're someone who does live in a paper-based reality, well, perhaps now there is paper that tells you you're free. So my question is, do you feel free now? And if you don't, then what will it take to make you feel free? And if you ever are free, what will you do with that freedom? As I said, folks, we are truly a fascinating species who seems to operate without any real rhyme or reason and seems to be squarely rooted in so vastly opposite polarities at the same time. Of course, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, so the more negative the system makes itself, then the more apparent it becomes, and the more people will wake up, and the more people will work to implement positive change. But when I look around me at the state of the world, especially the state of the country that I'm in, and I see the destruction that's taking place in this country as a result of corporate corruption, I cannot help but wonder just what it will take for people to begin to act and realize that they can't change the world by sitting there staying in a high frequency unless they are prepared to apply that high frequency to the world around them. And it isn't done through a state of meditation. It's done through a state of positive action. But that positive action has to be based in respect for oneself and respect for the people around you as yourself in order to have any real effect or gain any momentum within the community. I truly believe that it would be a very, very simple thing to do and that we could change reality in three seconds if people simply shifted their perspective. And I've said so a million times and I still say so. And I have not deviated from that opinion. And all the other opinions that I may have changed over the years as more knowledge comes to hand, that opinion has stayed with me for a very long time because I know it is an ultimate and absolute truth. The question is, what will it take for us to do that? What will it take for us to change our perspective and change this beautiful world, to put it back on track? And I think the world wants it to happen as well. I think the earth itself is changing its vibration and many of the people such as myself who speak out about this system and who work to bring about positive change are doing so as a result of the resonant frequency that we receive from the planet and that we receive from creation around us. I think that's why there are so many people speaking out now because the earth and consciousness itself wants us to do so. Indeed, it depends on us doing so. And any shift that is going to happen, folks, it depends on us being involved. But that's about it for me, folks. We've reached the end of the show. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. It always is. Thank you to anybody who has ever made a contribution to thecrowhouse.com. And for those who do contribute, I, I really cannot thank you enough for the support you've shown me over the years. Were it not for you, I simply would not be able to do what I do, and I would not be able to bring these shows to you every week. So thank you very much for that. But I must go, folks. I'm completely out of time. I'll look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please take care until then. In luck care.